I think as I please and I do as I want. My choices are my own and my will is free. This seems the simplest of notions, the essence of me, right? Why then is free will among the most vexing of philosophical problems? Here's why. No one knows how free will works. My brain is a physical system of billions of neurons in which every action is caused by previous actions. Science seemingly permits no gaps in which my free will can operate. Yet, free will is what makes us human, empowering our sense of personal self and making collective responsibility possible. So do human brains have free will? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. How to explore free will? It's really tricky, because what looks like a straight path to solution morphs into a complex maze to nowhere. I should first frame the problem. That's why I start in Berkeley with a leading philosopher of mind, John Searle. John, the problem of free will sounds like it's just a, one of the many philosophical problems, but the more you think about it, the more it becomes a window to see into the, the entire philosophy of mind. Well, the problem of free will arises, and this is typical of philosophical problems, because we have two inconsistent hypotheses, and we don't see how to give up on either of them. Uh, both determinism and free will seem to have overwhelming arguments in their favor. Determinism just fits in with what we know about how the world works. Determinism says every event has causally sufficient conditions. Uh, human actions are events, so they must have causally sufficient conditions. They and, and yet we feel we have free will. But at the same time, we feel we have free will. We just have this experience of what I call the gap. Okay, so, so these are inconsistent, yes. contradictory positions. We have to deal with it. Now, you believe that consciousness is based entirely on the brain. Yes. Therefore, we got to go to the neurobiology. Exactly. How do we deal with it? How do we get free will out of neurobiology, out of neurons and, uh, and uh, 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 connecting with one another and just yeah. sending electrical impulses back I, and forth? I, I don't know, and neither does anybody else, but I can tell you some hypotheses. It seems to me when I get one of these problems where I just can't see the way out is to try different hypotheses. Uh -huh. And I, I, my daddy was an engineer and my mother was a doctor, so I tend to think of this as a practical problem. I mean, if you were an engineer, how would you build a, uh, a robot that had free will and how would it differ from one that didn't have free will? will. So okay. think of it that way. Now, if I were building a conscious robot that didn't have free will, it looks like I just use traditional uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, programs. I would de design it in such a way that its behavior was completely determined. I call that hypothesis one. Hypothesis one says all of our behavior is completely determined. It's strictly an illusion that we have free will, and we would build a robot, we might give it the illusion that it had free will, but it would be completely determined. Now, in that model, you have the, the components of the robot, or in our case, the neurons, yeah. have, are absolutely determined by yes, prior events. absolutely. Now, let me add something to that, and that is, I think that as far as our actual experience is concerned, psychological determinism is probably false. That is, it, as far as we can tell, the, I could have these psychological states and still choose that as opposed to that. The real danger, the real hard argument for determinism is not psychological determinism, but neurobiological determinism. That the neurobiology, which also fixes the psychology, determines the s subsequent states of the neurobiology. And if they determine the subsequent states of the neurobiology, we are completely determined. 
Now, that hypothesis is certainly consistent with what we know about science. Yes. It would be so, it, it's reasonably simple. You yeah. stated it very clearly. It's easy to understand. It just doesn't sound right. Well, it, it, we can't live with it because we, we have what I call the experience of the gap where we have a sense of ourselves making up our mind to do something where we sense we had alternative possibilities. So what would the world be like if free will were true, if it were an actual fact. And so once this again, hypothesis this too. hypothesis too. So let's try that out. What we would have to have in hypothesis two is a situation not only where the higher level conscious states were not by themselves causally sufficient to fix the next conscious state in line, but, and this is where it gets more basic, the lower level neurobiological states were not by themselves sufficient to fix the next neurobiological state. I want to throw it even when I say that, because there are no <laughs> gaps in the brain in a way that I'm supposing that there are, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are at the level of psychology because we experience it. However, let's just keep pushing. Yes, relentlessly as we can. Is there any part of the universe that we know is indeterministic? And the only part we know for sure is quantum mechanics. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the indeterminism at the quantum level goes all the way up. Okay, but now, it used to seem to me that's got nothing to do with free will because quantum in indeterminacy gives you only randomness. And free will is not the same as randomness. Very different. Yes, so if it were the case that quantum indeterminacy is gonna provide the base of free will, it's no help to us at all, because all it would give us is randomness. Now that used to seem to me absolutely convincing, but I now realize there is a, an actual fallacy of composition there. Uh, the fallacy of composition says the features of the whole system have to be the same as the features of which the system is composed. If the features that compose the system are random, then the whole system must be random. That doesn't follow. The only way that I can squeeze a, a meaningful hypothesis out of hypothesis two is to suppose that the quantum indeterminacy is sufficient to account for the existence of consciousness. Cons Which you never wanted to no, admit I, before. No, I, I, I'd always uh, I seem to me that desperate move. I, I, and and uh, there's Searle's third law, which is whenever philosophers and even sometimes physicists talk about quantum mechanics, yeah. mostly what comes out is hot air. And I don't want to be a victim of yeah. Searle's third law. But let's just keep pushing relentlessly. Right. You would have to imagine a situation where the neurobiology of consciousness inherits the 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 lack of causally sufficient conditions at the quantum level without inheriting the randomness. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know. I'm just trying to tell you what it would be like to follow out uh, uh, hypothesis to, to its logical conclusion. And if that sounds disgusting to you, I must say it sounds disgusting <laughs> to me. What? It's just the best I can do if I'm trying to make sense <laughs> out of free will. One thing I might tell you is, though I think we cannot live on the assumption of determinism, if you try hypothesis two, it looks a mess. Because instead of the mystery of, of um, free will, I give you three, maybe four mysteries. I give you the mystery of free will, the mystery of consciousness, the mystery of the self, and now the mystery of quantum mechanics. You got three or four mysteries for one. <laughs> On free will, John offers two hypotheses, a stark and scary choice. Either determinism is correct and free will is an illusion, or quantum mechanics generates consciousness, which kicks up a hornet's nest of problems. My free will and illusion, I can't accept that. My inner awareness is too present, too personal. But invoking quantum mechanics asks too much of physics, making physics into magic. Free will is maddening. I need a starting point that's secure. For me, it's the brain. I did my doctorate on how the brain works. Can the brain help with free will? I'll ask brain scientists. Rodolfo Linus at the NYU School of Medicine is a comprehensive neuroscientist whose research spans the molecular and the cognitive. Free will is an illusion we have. And what is that illusion? Free will is our ability to follow the tyranny of one's own neurons. 
<laughs> we don't have a choice. But we say we have free will because we actually do what the neurons say we do. And you're defining that as free will. As free will, as opposed to the tyranny of other people's neurons. Oh. oh, oh. So, so that is a distinction. Oh. If I follow my neurons, I, have, I do what I want to do. This is called free will. If I have to follow the law that I don't like, I'm being sat upon, whatever. Somebody else's neurons are now telling me what to do. So it is the distinction between the intrinsic properties of your brain, what, what you, what the anatomy tells you what you should do, which is, by the way, what you think you are, are wanting to do. Now, okay. Aaron Zydell, a neuroscientist at UCLA, tests split-brain patients in whom, for medical reasons, the connections between their brain's left and right hemispheres have been severed. The split brain case shows a very dramatic example of how free will can be dissociated from your intention in the sense, in the following sense. So we have two different halves of the brain of a split brain patient. We have two different intentions to act, and we have seen examples of that, where one hand fights with the other in selecting a dress or in trying to solve a problem. Each one has a different intention, and that's possible, and therefore it, ma it makes it possible to have independent sensation, perception, memory, decision, and action in each side. That means each side is separately conscious, has a separate intention, a separate free will, and a separate moral responsibility, therefore. So far, seems okay, but what if they are in conflict with each other? Suppose one does something that one doesn't like, or that society doesn't like. So suppose we find that um, a split-brain patient has committed an, a, a social act, in fact, a crime. One side committed a crime, the other side did not. In fact, we can show that at that time, one side was dominant. Why do you assign uh, guilt or moral responsibility? Here's a case where talking about a person as a unified whole is misleading because, in fact, it was one half of the person that made the decision, perpetrated the act, and therefore should be morally responsible. Why do you publish, uh, punish the other side? And yet, how do we punish one side and not the other? Given that we were driven to, give, to, to act in a certain way, how do we say that we have freedom of the will? It's all biologically determined. Well, what's as far, my answer, unsatisfactory probably from a philosophical point of view, is that with, as long as it is within our ability to control these processes, to modulate them, to prevent a certain action from occurring, we are morally responsible. If I can control the phenomena, if I can make myself behave one way or another, I don't care if it was determined ahead of time that I had that ability, that's what I call freedom. And that's possible, and therefore, it makes it possible. Inside my own head, yes. Roger Walsh, a psychiatrist at UC Irvine, is an expert on religious and spiritual practices. One thing that is very clear from my clinical work with people is that it makes an enormous difference in people's lives as to whether they feel they have free will. And one of the signs of psychopathology, for example, of severe depression, is that people feel helpless. They don't feel they have any control. In fact, one of the ways to get people depressed is simply to put them in environments where they feel they have no control. But the other side, even people in any environment can feel a lack of control if they're depressed. So the practical implication from clinical experience seems to be that there is real value for us in choosing to see ourselves as having choice. So even though it may be an illusion, it's a helpful illusion in a pragmatic way because it makes our lives better? It may or may not be an illusion, I don't know. But certainly I know from clinical experience that it practically and pragmatically, it makes an enormous difference. Michael Mersenich, a neuroscientist at UC San Francisco, is a pioneer in neuroplasticity. 
the brain's remarkable capacity to reorganize itself in response to experience. We, we look at the brains of most people that commit, commit horrible violent acts. Mm -hmm. They're not normal. They have damage, they're wounded. They're, 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 they, have, they, they carry inherited faults or they carry changes that have, been, that have been driven into them by a function of how the brain has been engaged from that point of life, early in life, to the point in which the incredible or violent act is created. And, and in fact, one of the amazing things to me about this is that in a sense, we don't blame the brain. We blame the person, irregardless of their history. But if you think they have free will, you think the pathology really allows them to have free, the free control that you or I would have, you're crazy. And you think that they're just as responsible for their actions, that's nuts. You know, we are so unprincipled. This is so unethical. This is so fundamentally unfair. If a child is beaten every day of their life until they're six, we expect them to act just like we do with refined ethical sensitivities. It's nuts. So we know of many examples. Obsessive compulsive disorder is a clear example where, in a sense, the person can't be blamed, can't help but do the repeated act of washing their hands 500 times or having to go back to the kitchen 40 times. So I believe in free will with limits. Henry Stamp is a quantum physicist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he deals with the bizarre actions of atoms and atomic particles. My view on the matter starts with the claim that the idea of free will makes no sense at all in a deterministic universe. If you have a world where you have two processes, one process is psychological, and one process is physical, as seems to be the case in quantum mechanics, then my idea of free will is that the, the choice is made in the psychological realm. According to classical mechanics, the physical world is causally complete, namely the physical past completely determines the physical future, and therefore you uh, have a complete determinism. And anything that happens um, at least insofar as it affects the physical world, is completely determined by something that happened before. So it's not free in the, in the, in the sense that you think it's... And if our brains are just totally part of a classical materialistic system, it's locked into that same system, That's right, right. and therefore there's no free will. That's right. So I think that once you start with the premise that classical mechanics is right, that you're forced to the conclusion there is no free will, and people who say it's an illusion, would be correct. Okay, now let's see how quantum mechanics uh, injects real free will into the equation. The main point is that the quantum mechanical equations dealing with the physical world only partly, they do not determine what's actually going to happen. They determine possibilities for what might happen. Something else is needed. A question needs to be posed. And the way it works in, in actual practice in quantum mechanics is that this something else is what we describe as our conscious processing, reasons and values and things like this. Then I can make sense of free will, not by saying it's free, it's not determined by anything at all, which I think is somehow nonsensical. It's got to be determined by something. But it's determined by reason and values and psychological processing determines it. Once you accept quantum mechanics, there is room for free will and there is a need for some choices to be made, which are not made by the physical process. The more I try to narrow the problem of free will, the more it seems to expand. The beliefs of brain scientists, as once I was, are rooted in demonstrable facts. But when they wander into philosophy, do they lose their way? What most brain scientists think explains free will, I think, does not. When it comes to free will, brain science, at least for now, has reached an impasse. I find no real progress, much less closure. Where else to go? What about framing the free will problem differently? say in terms of mental causation. I'll get Colin McGinn's take. 
Collins, a leading philosopher of mind who envisions consciousness as more profound than we can imagine, perhaps ever imagine. When we think about the physical world, we seem to have two notions of how things happen. One is they happen deterministically, that is, they follow from laws. On the other hand, we have the idea of something happening randomly. And in some parts of physics, it's supposed that randomness goes down to the very basis of, of how things happen. But when we start, when we apply those two notions of how things happen to human actions, they run into problems because on neither of those understandings does human action turn out to be free. Notoriously, and laws, then they couldn't have been otherwise. And so they're determined to be as they are. And the causation there is just ordinary physical causation, which seems incompatible with uh, freedom of the will. So some people have thought, well, then we have to go to the other extreme and suppose that f actions occur randomly. And they've even supposed that uh, quantum indeterminacy yeah. is the foundation of this randomness. <laughs> but that's even worse because there's nothing free about a random action. So that's, the, that's the, the, the structure of the problem. I think what we need to do is recognize, to begin with, that we need, to we need to assume that there's another kind of causation or how things happen, mental causation. And we can say what the causal relations are. We can say, for example, that my beliefs and desires enter causally into a relation with my actions and my decisions. So there is a causal relation there, and we can say, and we do, do say, it was because of my beliefs and desires that I did what I did. So you need the idea of, of mental causation. Now somebody may say to me at that point, but what is this idea of mental causation? How right, do you explain right, right. it? My point there is that you can't explain it in terms of ordinary physical causation. It's a sui generis type of causation. It's a different kind of thing. If you say to me, well, all right, tell me what it is, my answer is this, I don't know what it is. I think it's mysterious what it is. So there is a kind of causation, but we don't have any good theory of what that causation is. They don't determine the action in the usual way a law determines it. Uh, so they do it in some other way. Now, if you ask me what way that is, I don't think, I don't think we have an answer to that. You're trying to show there may be a path yeah. in terms of a different kind of causation. Right. What it is, we don't know, but right. everything else doesn't work, so right. maybe we should I'm go trying along to, this I'm path. trying to save free will. And if there is such a type of causation, then free will can be saved because it, it depends on that type of causation. It doesn't solve the problem of free will in the way some people have wanted to solve it by specifying the mechanism by which choices and actions occur. It just provides space for there to be a mechanism <laughs> and just says, well, let's not try to force all kinds of causation into the mold of the physical causation that, that we apply in the sciences. Because all the other efforts to uh, explain free will within the world of physical causation... They fail. They fail pretty quickly. And systematically. And pretty you can't, quickly. And you can't fix them up in the same terms. Yeah. So the first step is to recognize that modeling mental causation on physical causation is a mistake. Mm. That can't be done. So now if we then say, well, then there's another type of causation, then we can't argue anymore. Look, either it's deterministic or it's random. Therefore, it's not either. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Then we can say, because there's now a third possibility. Mm. And that, if that possibility obtains, then we can suppose that things, actions are free in virtue of that mental causation, even though we have to concede that we don't understand the nature of that mental causation. So what do we know about free will? If you're not a dualist and you think physicalism is all there is, it's only force fields and matter and energy, of course then there's no free will. Well, I mean, because I don't know what, what, what else could it be. But a, a lot of people who believe in, in purely physicalism, materialism, really try to create a free will. I mean... Yeah, but I don't see what... I, I don't see where that free will is supposed to come from. The physical world works in two ways determinism and randomness. Neither befriends free will. Some philosophers argue that determinism is compatible with free will, but they must diminish free will in one way or another. To save free will, options are limited, apparently to two. First choice, quantum mechanics is involved in consciousness. But how is randomness and probabilities free will? Moreover, most scientists assert that quantum mechanics cannot explain cognition. 
because quantum mechanics cannot work in the large, warm, wet world of biological brains. Second choice. Mental causation. Psychological processes of intentions, values, and the like. But wouldn't such mental causation need at least some independence from physical brains? And no one has any idea how this might be. I feel forced to conclude with a stark choice. Either free will is an illusion, or something large is missing from current understanding. Of only one thing, I'm sure, free will gets us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.